to Football Sunday, and you already know this, but I'm going to tell you anyways, today is the day. When I played in the Super Bowl, I remember waking up on that morning and thinking exactly the same thing. After all the ups and downs of the season, after a rough road through the playoffs, and after a lifetime of working so hard for this moment, finally, today is the day. In the next few moments, you'll be hearing from players who are playing in today's Super Bowl. You'll also experience inspiring stories from NFL players that are learning to live in something we call the increase. Don't worry, we'll explain it as we go. So thanks so much for joining us. It's Super Bowl Sunday. Today is the day. I'm a big gum chewer. Uh, as soon as I get to the stadium on game day, I put about four or five sticks of gum in my mouth and I chew it for maybe two minutes and then I go get another four or five. I always have my headphones on and I listen to various music, uh, a lot of Christian music, a lot of, I listen to some R&B and country as well. So smooth stuff. I just remember uh, watching all the games when I was a, a young young kid to, with my friends' houses, you know, just going to their houses and, and uh, sitting there and just wishing and, and praying and hoping that I'd get to a Super Bowl one day. Uh, whether to watch one or, or to play in one, obviously to play in one would be nice. When the Seahawks went to the Super Bowl, played the Steelers, and, you know, just got together with a few of my best buddies, and, you know, we had the whole, like, smorgasbord, you know, we had all kinds of bad stuff to eat. And so we would always get together, our youth group, and we would have, like, Super Bowl parties, and it was kind of like all of the youth group kids are hanging out and doing their own thing with a football game in the background. We all have events in our lives when our perspective changes. For the guys on the field today, just playing in the biggest game of their careers will change the way they view everything from here on out. I want to introduce you to an NFL player whose perspective on life has taken a radical turn. Brandon Marshall is a Pro Bowl wide receiver for the Chicago Bears. And ever since he's entered the league, he has proven that he is one of the best. But Brandon's personal life has not always been an easy one. As a matter of fact, he's gone through some life things that are way bigger than football. Where I'm from, like, football is a way of life. It's like the culture. There wasn't basketball, there wasn't soccer, there wasn't baseball. So I can't even remember not having a football or not being a part of the game. It's like it's a part of my DNA. I remember taking a flight from Denver to Atlanta and I had my Bible and uh, I guess I was trying to read it you know and there was this lady she said are you a Christian why would she ask this like isn't it obvious but the way she asked in her facial expression made me really dig a little deeper she saw you know how hesitant I was and she said you know what just pray for clarity so for four years I began to pray for clarity every single day I was in the most dysfunctional relationship, dysfunctional marriage ever. Uh, it was horrible. You have two people who really love each other but couldn't get it right. And uh, my wife, you know, she just wasn't happy. I just thought a man was supposed to just provide. You know, I looked around and said, you have a beautiful house, you have a roof over your head. You know, we can do anything we want when we want to do it. You know, why aren't you happy? We have money in our bank account. And I just couldn't get it. I thought that's what a man was. One day, my wife came home. She said, I'm going to church. And she's like, do you want to go? I said, no. So for a whole year, my wife would go to church with a friend. 
and I, w I was so bitter. I was like, who's this person you're going to church with? You know, she doesn't know us. You know, you, you letting people in her business. That's how bitter I was. My wife was trying to do something really positive and change things for herself and, and, and us. And I'm sitting here worried about who she's going to church with. And I dove into the Word. I was relentless in my praying. I was relentless in, in my meditating on the Word. At that moment, you know, I had friends come around and say, hey, you need to really sit down and talk to someone. You know, and I found myself at McLean Hospital for three months, away from my wife, away from my home. I took something up there to Boston, to Waltham, Massachusetts, that I don't think anyone else in those groups took with them. And that was Jesus Christ. Every single day, every single night, I got on my knees and I just uh, begged God for Him to give me clarity. The same prayer. After a month and a half being up there, you know, it was like, man, I'm feeling something I never felt before. God's revealing Himself to me in, in ways He never, you know, revealed Himself to me. I remember having worship in my car by myself, listening to praise music. It was like, this is amazing. Like, I'm driving down the highway with my hands up, like, what is this that I'm feeling? Like, I've been praying clarity for four years. I've been praying for the cycle to be broken for four years, and it's happened. She came over to tell me that she wasn't coming home. We never even got to that part of it. We just started talking and expressing ourselves and praying. She just felt something. She was like, this is a different man. And uh, months later, that's when she finally told me something. I really was there to tell you that, you know, I wasn't coming home. You know, so I'm just so thankful that I had a praying wife because I don't know where I would be. I was able to call my father and say, man, Dad, you know, man, we're in this cycle, but this is how we can fix it. A year later, he ended up giving his life to Christ. My brother gave his life to Christ. My mother gave her life to Christ. My sister gave her life to Christ. We're stuck in this cycle, but we're stuck in this cycle because we don't understand the root of it. For us, we figured out what the root of it was, and that was the absence of Jesus in our, in our homes, and now he's the center of everything that we do. As you can see, Brandon really is an amazing person. He's known as a leader in the NFL and a mentor to a lot of young players. You know what? There's another amazing person with the story too. Are you ready for this? It's you, it's your church, it's your pastors, it's your leaders, in your community and in your city. Today is the day, right? But what if today is the day for something bigger than just the Super Bowl? What if today is the day you see the world through different eyes, to see the story behind the story? Your church has already partnered with some great organizations that help meet the needs of the world, and you can get involved. It's amazing what God can do through broken people who just say yes to Him. You know, everybody kind of looks at the height of it. They look at the Super Bowl. But the most important part that it has always been to me is just the journey. You work hard as a youngster to get to high school, and high school to college, and college to pro. You know, my dad and I have always talked about, you know, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could play in this game? And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And, um, you know, coming out of high school, I wasn't really high, highly recruited. And right now, it's just a dream come true. And I'm just so blessed to be here. And it's been kind of a journey the whole way. And I feel like I, I have a ton of support behind me. And, and uh, that really means a lot to me. Most definitely, I would not be here without my mother. Um, my mother is like my, my backbone. Uh, my father passed away when I was a young child. Um, so um, 
I think my mother for sure for instilling the things in me as a child to help me know what's right, know what's wrong, know what it means to work hard, see what it looks like when somebody works hard. My dad was the one that kind of spearheaded the whole long snapping thing. And I mean, without him and his encouragement and pushing me and, and helping me and being there for me, I mean, I for sure wouldn't be here. It's, a, it's of course my dad. And um, I told him after our first Super Bowl, that's the first thing I said to him when I gave him a hug. I was like, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you because he was the one throwing the football with me in the backyard, you know, playing catch with me. The next story we're gonna tell you is one that's very special to my family and I. Matthew Hasselbeck and I walked through some very difficult times in life together, and his friendship has had a profound impact on my life. Remember in the Bible when John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease? That really meant something important. It meant that it's on us to make our life less noticeable so his life is more noticeable. And Matthew's learned what it really means to live a life that's decreasing so the life of Christ can increase through him. This is his story. My dad played football. When people would ask me what I wanted to do when I grew up, I would say, I don't know, I just guess I'll just play in the NFL like my dad. I was drafted in the sixth round, pick 187. I can remember when I got the call from the Green Bay Packers, Andy Reid, the quarterback's coach, calls me and he says, uh, Hey, uh, tell me what you think about this next pick. And I'm looking at the ticker, and it's like Green Bay Packers, it starts flashing, and it's my name. And I'm thinking, you guys are fools. <laughs> no one else is gonna draft me. I throw the phone up, I'm like, we're celebrating. I pick the phone back up, I'm like, hey, uh, coach, you know no one is probably gonna draft me. You know, like, you didn't need to draft me. But I was fired up. I get there, and I, and I see they've got a ton of quarterbacks. But my coach came in and he, he kind of instilled some confidence in me that I didn't have in myself. And one of the first things he says to me, he's like, listen, you need to believe that you can be the backup quarterback for this team. He was kind of like, he was a little churchy for me. I don't know, I was just very suspicious. Come to find out through uh, years of being with him and then um, you know, seeing him go through things in his life that the dude was legit and he was a good friend and a great teammate. I got in the elevator and I was like critical of what the chaplain had talked about. I was like, man, I'm so glad this guy that I invited said no on our team because the chaplain's never gonna reach that guy with that kind of a message. And Trent looks at me, he's like, it's not the chaplain's job to reach that guy. It's the chaplain's job to teach you so that you can reach that guy. And I was like, whoa, really? <laughs> I'm good at teaching a young quarterback the playbook. Hey, what do you do here on uh, Fox 2 XY? Like, oh, dude, the, the play action is the whole deal. And I'm gonna tell you, nine out of 10 times you're throwing the tight end. Unless they're in quarters coverage, you're gonna throw the post. But otherwise, you're gonna go to tight end right to the X. And I guarantee you the X is gonna be open every single time. Unless they're playing two man on the backside, or it's press, bump, and run, then you're gonna have your fullback. And it'll be an easy game, it'll be second and four. Like, I, I know that, I can give that away, I can share. And not only can I run the play, I can teach you the play. And so, I wasn't at a point with my faith that I could share it in a way that I knew it. Like I knew the playbook. Like I was the starter. You know, I was like a rookie. Even though I had had the playbook for years, I didn't really know it. I wasn't making disciples. I was introducing people to the chaplain and feeling good about myself. There was a moment for me where I really felt something powerful that I can't even explain it was last year uh, we were at a conference type thing and uh, I had invited our two young quarterbacks I was like man I hope it's okay for them I hope they like it I mean I, I like it I hope they like it and they were teaching on this on baptism 
And uh, I'm like walking to them thinking like, hey, I was going to tell my baptism story about like, hey, I, just, I know it's a little, I, I don't know how you feel about this. And, uh, and both of them and their wives said, hey, um, our team chaplain's not here. Would you be willing to baptize us? And I was just like, like, are you kidding me? God is present in all things, big or small, all the time. He can do anything He wants to do with anyone He wants to do, through anyone He wants to do it with. I love what Matthew said and the way he said it. I wasn't making disciples. I was introducing people to the chaplain and feeling good about myself. And if you're a Christ follower, you can probably relate to that. So for us, maybe today's the day, not just because it's a Super Bowl, maybe today's the day that we take a hard look into the mirror and ask, am I making disciples with my actions and my words, or am I simply relying on somebody else to do it for me? Now that's a hard question, but it needs to be asked. What if today is the day that we own the deep desire of God's heart to go make disciples? As you live life and you experience different challenges and obstacles, you tend to put limits on God and think, well, ah, maybe that's too much for me to ask, or man, he's already done X, Y, Z, and you know, I, I don't know about this situation, it's pretty tough. And time after time, God is showing me that there's nothing too big for Him. I'm discovering God to be so much more of a relational God. I think there's some times that we, we kind of make Him this concept or this idea or just this, this power just so, you know, so far-fetched and that we, can't, we, we don't really grasp that He's a personal God and that He wants to be a part of our everyday lives. You know, and I, He sent His Son to feel what we feel, the struggles, uh, the heartache, the pains. He sent his son to understand those things and to stand in the gap for us. He's helped me surround myself with a bunch of men um, on the team that are strong Christians and um, God has just been awesome in my life and, and I realize how much he's been with me through my life before I knew him. My situation is unique in that this is the second Super Bowl that I've gone to where I've had, I've been on injured reserve and uh, knee surgeries. I think I'm discovering him to be more gracious than I ever realized. I'm not discovering to be any type of particular person, but I, what I am discovering is that his grace is unmeasured. It's all the good things and how he um, provides for us and how he sustains us and, and how he's the only reason for anything to be done. And he's the whole why of why anyone would do anything. And I think that. That's true for everybody if they believe it or not. He's a God that uh, completely loves and is compassionate. I think that's the biggest thing that I've realized. You know, I've got, had a lot of great things happen in my life. I've had some bad things happen in my life uh, and some ups and downs. And, and through it all, he's still been the consistent God uh, that he says he is. And that's the biggest thing that you continue to realize. So you've probably guessed by now that everyone you've heard from today is a follower of Jesus. We don't want to hide that. And if you're interested, you can watch more stories just like those at the Increase website. I guess it all comes down to this. Today we're all fans, right? And that's great. I hope you enjoy being a fan today. But I hope you don't approach Jesus the same way. Because Jesus extends an invitation to follow him not just to applaud him from a safe distance. And maybe today is the day you make a decision to follow Christ. And if you're a Christ follower already, maybe today's the day that you take another step closer, another step in your faith journey. I wanna introduce you to a former NFL player and a really good friend of mine, Miles McPherson. He played for the LA Rams, is a member of the NFL family, and now is the lead pastor at the Rock Church in San Diego. Just about everyone I know thinks that the more fame you have, the more money you have, the more power, the more parties, the more fun, the more fulfilled you're gonna be. You just heard stories from NFL players 
telling you that that is not true. I was that guy, I played four years in the NFL. The first two years I was using cocaine, smoking around, wanting party and women, all the things that I thought would make me happy, all the things that I thought would fulfill my life, and I was empty. And then one day, a teammate was having a Bible study on the plane, got in my face, and asked me a very powerful question. He said, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? I thought I would go to heaven. I had gone to a private school. I had never killed anybody. I thought, oh, certainly God's not going to send me to hell. And then he shared the gospel with me. He said, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Certainly you and I know we're sinners, we're not perfect. But then he said that the penalty of sin is death is spiritual death and physical death. Because sin is a spiritual offense, the death that we experience is both physical and spiritual. Physical death, we all know we go to, into the grave, but sin also kills our dreams, it kills our relationships, it kills our opportunities, it kills our joy. But then when you die and you physically die, you go to a place where you're eternally separated from God. I had a guy, a friend on my team, who didn't want to have anything to do with God. And I thought to myself, if he lived his whole life and said, God, I don't want to have anything to do with you, when he died, God would give him exactly what he wanted. He would go to a place where he would never be around God. The Bible calls that place hell. And the Bible says also that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved not only from hell, but from the death you're experiencing now. Jesus wants to give you eternal life and abundant life. The Bible says that while we were sinners doing our own thing, Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. He died on the cross to pay the price for your sin and my sin. He actually died in your place. And so you have an opportunity. You can accept Jesus Christ as your savior and accept eternal forgiveness and go to heaven when you die. Or you can reject Christ and go to hell and spend eternally away from God. It seems like an easy, easy decision. So we're going to give you an opportunity in a minute to ask Christ to forgive you of your sin. But before we do that, I want to make sure you clearly understand what I'm talking about. There was a guy who walked across a tightrope, a wire, across the Niagara Falls, big waterfall. And it took three hours to get across. And then he decided he was going to go back and put a wheelbarrow on top of the wire and put dirt in the wheelbarrow and take the wheelbarrow across the wire. And right before he left and started walking across the wire, he looked down to the crowd and said, do you believe I could take this wheelbarrow across this wire and drop no dirt out of the wheelbarrow? And the whole crowd said, yes, you are the great, greatest tightrope walker around. And he looked at this little boy, he said, do you believe that I could take this wheelbarrow across this wire without dropping any dirt? And the little boy said, I believe. And he took the wheelbarrow and he dumped the dirt out. And he said, if you believe, get in. When you pray this prayer, if you pray this prayer, you are getting in the wheelbarrow and you are telling God, I am surrendering my life to you. I now belong to you. After playing two years in the NFL, at five o'clock in the morning, I said, Lord, I believe. And I got in the wheelbarrow and never did cocaine again, never smoked marijuana again, stopped cursing, got back with my girlfriend. We've been married 30 years. God changed my life. God wants to change your life. He wants to transform your heart. And so right now, if you're saying, I want to get in the wheelbarrow, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe the penalty of my sin is death. I want to get in the wheelbarrow and surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now, wherever you are. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. But as you pray, you must have faith that God knows you, that he loves you, and he has a great plan for your life. And he wants to walk with you now on earth. So right now, close your eyes and bow your head. And just listen to me. I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you to pray with me if you would like to ask Christ to be your Savior. Dear Jesus, I know that you know everybody listening and watching right now. You know their heart, you know their life, and you love them dearly. No matter what they've done, you are willing right now to forgive them and to grant them eternal life and to live in their heart. As you're listening, if you would like to ask Christ to forgive you of your sin, if you would like to receive eternal salvation, I want you to pray this prayer with me by faith. Pray, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that the penalty of my sin is death. And I believe that Jesus loves me. I believe that he is the Lord. I believe he died and rose from the dead for my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Come live in my heart. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. 
I want to be born all over again. I want to be born of the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being patient. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been an exciting time together. Thank you for allowing us to challenge you and encourage you. Our prayer for you is simple, that you would love Jesus deeply and live for him radically so that he may increase in your life. God bless. Today is the day. Enjoy the game.